Greetings and welcome to the Warhammer Underworlds tier list for quarter two, 2021. This is kind of new for YouTube, but if you, see one, if you want to see what the previous tier list was for quarter one, you can check that out in the episode description below, because originally this was just on the blog, but I've decided to show on the blog and my YouTube channel. Before we get into the tiers, please remember to like and subscribe and let me know in the comments below what you think of the tier list. Do you agree, disagree? And what changes would you think you would make? As I explained in the article before, every quarter I'll be going over my own personal tier list for Warhammer Underworlds. Due to the lack in number of physical tournaments, for safety reasons of course, there's very little data on that front that can be used, because it doesn't really exist. As a result, this is based off of my own personal experience from playing games, casting tournaments, and my own knowledge, uh, as well as experience too, and you know, time I spent playtesting as well. Remember, nothing here is set in stone, and it's aimed at how I see the general player will perform with these warbands. Players of higher skill or with more experience can perform exceedingly well with lower tier warbands, but in general, this is a great resource for the everyday player who is also looking at how to plan out their matchups for competitive practice. Now we come to the tiers themselves. Here's what my ratings generally mean. An S tier warband is a warband that is incredibly strong and also maybe even broken. Either way, you have to plan against playing against warbands in this tier. They're super consistent, something you'll very likely encounter in a tournament and can generally easily get into the top cut and or win an event. An A tier warband is strong, but missing a few things that make them super powerful like an S tier warband. Still, you're very likely to encounter this warband and it has a high chance of making the top cut at an event. B tier warbands are still good, but usually more dependent off of universal cards for their power. A warband you'll always have to keep in mind, but it suffers a bit to keep it out from the higher tiers. They will need more work from the player to get a tournament win. C tier warbands are middle of the road, stable and consistent, but not quite strong. You could generally go on a 50-50 win ratio with this warband at a tournament. A D tier warband is a warband that suffers quite a lot, has a lot of bad matchups and or are hit hard by universal card rotation as well as other effects of the meta. E tier warbands are just bad, usually a mix of old and outdated warband mechanics and faction cards, has warbands that do the same role as them but generally much better. You'll be lucky to win a round with them in a tournament. Now we come to the influencing factors of the tier list. As before in the first one, uh, I'll cover this again. It's slightly changed from last time because before the main one was rotation, but I'll go through what's affecting the tier list and the game now. Primacy is still the biggest universal multiplier introduced into Warhammer Underworlds. It makes aggro so much better by giving you extra glory for doing what you wanted to do already. Warbands that can maximise the most from it gain much power, as well as those warbands who are difficult to give away the primacy to the opponent. Unfortunately, this means that warbands with lots of 2-3 to three wound fighters will suffer greatly because of this. This has only gotten more problematic with the release of cards that maximise the use of primacy, such as Primal Lunge, which is basically a retooled ready for action. If you're still not playing Primacy now, you're at a massive disadvantage, and honestly, I haven't seen anyone not playing it. Every player basically is, and for a good reason too. The essential card pack bringing back Shadespire, Night Vault, and Beastgrave Universal cards that are immune to rotation has had an effect too. While it may not have seemed like a big shakeup, the essential card pack has shifted some warbands around but I'll also allow others to cement their position, for better or for worse. Without any new FAQ and Forsaken and Restricted list, the effects of having no new balance is making games a mess, honestly. There's so much broken jank floating about freely at the moment that the S tier warbands are getting obnoxiously strong. Need I remind you that we last had an FAQ in June 2020, 
nearly a year ago and with no new Forsaken and Restricted list since December 2020 is also starting to be felt. Now, a lot of things would be fixed by a new FAR list, but a new FAQ would be awesome too, so that certain things could be clarified and certain fighters have their fighter cards nerfed, like what happened with Varklav. I think the biggest issue now is timing when you gain primacy, because you've got the thing of what happens after an activation, what's the order for reactions, primacy and inspiring. Note that I no longer consider rotation to be a big factor now, thanks to the influx of Diachasm Universal cards. While the effects of rotation are still felt by certain warbands, the influx of new cards has now softened this blow. For the tier list, here is the previous one for 2021. Since then, we've had some minor changes to game progression and increased card pool. We have also had some tournaments, but still not enough to draw concrete data from. Uh, those tournaments are the Straight Out of Shades by monthly webcam tournaments, as well as the Vassal Clashes, such as the April Vassal Clash. There are some odd trends in there, which I'll cover in the S tier section. But as you can see, um, well, with the quarter one tier list, it's oddly the Beast Grave Warbands that are still up top, basically, with the Diachasm Warbands basically hitting A tier mostly, but this was obviously at the start of the season where we only had three Warbands. This is my current tier list for quarter two, 2021 of Warhammer Underworlds. Before explaining what each placement means, if you're on the article, you'll be able to see a key, but on this YouTube video, I'll be explaining if a warband has gone up a tier, down a tier, is unchanged, or is new. So if you want, you can pause the video now just to get your own snapshot of what the tier list is. But remember, if you click on the article, you can just download the image of well, the tier list, so you don't need to well, just keep pausing this video and referencing back to it. Uh, I will explain each tier in depth, well, each warband, but that's pretty much it for the tier list. Now I'll just be explaining what, why, why each warband is where it is. Please also note that warbands are ordered by time of release. There is no hidden meaning or ranking for warbands within tiers, because that would just be insane. But yeah, there's no hidden meaning about why warbands are ordered the way they are. For S tier warbands, Molog's mob has hardly changed because they're starting to become really broken. The same points still stand as last time. Abuse Primacy, abusing the buff to aggro, can generally deal with all other warbands, broken inspired ability on Molog, and an unrestricted universal card pool. Molog still can just score glory for simply existing, and the only way to beat him is to hope that the player using him misses every attack and or doesn't draw into Ferocious Resistance. For those who have forgotten, here's why Ferocious Resistance breaks Molog. Ferocious Resistance is just insanely good for fighters with a wounds characteristic of 5 or more. With Molog it literally breaks him. Giving him the potential to go from 1 wound to max wounds is just crazy. Now. I rank matchups like in fighting games on a scale of 10. A 5 5 matchup with another warband would be an even one. This card makes all of Molog's matchups gain huge pluses. It makes his hard matchups even and makes the ones he dominates basically unwinnable. With how Ferocious Resistance works currently, warbands like Scaife's Wild Hunt, Garrick's Reavers, and Morgwave's Blade Coven have no way to kill Molog and makes their 7 free matchups into 9 1 matchups against Molog. Not even restricting Ferocious Resistance would fix this power imbalance. It just needs banning or an errata. An interesting note here is that Molog has barely appeared in any recent tournaments. Why is this? Is it because everyone has figured him out? No. Some people do fear that everyone has planned to deal with the Trogoth but it seems it's more due to a gentleman's agreement between players. This is basically because Molog is so unfun to use and play against that people have just stopped using him. A great show of how bonkers balance is that Warhammer Underworlds has come to this. Lady Harrow's Mournflight remain an S tier warband and rightfully so. 
The new Universal cards have only made them stronger and more consistent. They're still just incredibly good. They can flex into whatever you want them to do, massively outscore the opponent if left alone, and just have amazing fighter card stats. They still fear Molog as he basically can one-shot them all, but the newer wall bands haven't added much uh, to shake them outside of possibly Drepper's Wraith Creepers. Continue to enjoy their lavish abusal of the Universal card pool, such as with stacking silent relics on them, because it's just really silly good. Once again, Morgok's crushers remain in the triumvirate of the S tier. They're still all five wounds and hit like a truck. Plentiful mobility cards mean that movement free isn't a problem for them anymore, and they have far too much in faction damage negation. They're just consistently overpowered, have amazing faction cards, coupled with amazing stats. You can't really do much to nerf a warband that's all five, fi uh, all five wounds, three fighters with one block. For A tier warbands, Ripper's Snarl Fangs remain unchanged. Aggro is still good, and they can easily slot in cards like Mischievous Spirits to shut down hold objective players. Sure, their accuracy isn't great, but the sheer volumes of attacks they pump out is what keeps them strong, along with the great tools and bonuses that Primacy offers. Don't forget their awesome faction cards too, which give them more ways to attack, hidden damage negation, and reliable scoring. Hrothgorn's Man Trappers are another non-mover. They still abuse the Hunter and Quarry mechanic, and that has only gotten more Universal cards to help bolster it. Note that Hrothgorn's Man Trappers got even more of a boost with more feature token flip cards, resulting in their Feed the Beast Grave deck becoming even better. Not enough to push them into S tier, but it results in this warband being the best for that kind of deck. Mayari's Purifiers may have lost a tiny bit of power, but they still remain in A tier. Consistent high scoring coupled with ways to get lots of defense dice consistently makes them hold their own with other aggro warbands. New hold objective tech from the Essentials card pack only makes them more reliable. Bolstered with great faction cards, Mayari's Purifiers are still demonstrating the power of the Luminous Realm Lords. The Dread Pageant remains static with the power of Slanesh, letting them hold their ground against other aggro warbands. Fast, consistent damage, and amazing damage negation keep them strong. Another plus one damage card, basically with Glory Seeker and some other essential pack cards, keep them versatile and powerful. The Star Bloodstalkers are a new entrant, bursting onto the scenes, showing the power of the Seraphon. Despite being a Horde Swarm warband with six fighters, they have tons of abilities and faction cards that give them a lot of power with consistency. The Great Plan is an amazing free glory objective card, and even without that, they have some good two glory end phase objectives they can score reliably. Also, Clack Troc gives them great aggro power coupled with the strengths of Otterpattle's crits. With another new entry, Drepper's Wraith Creepers may surprise some, especially as they are a starter set warband. Despite this and my prior statements in my warband review, they are incredibly strong. Having two fighters that are only three wounds does hold them back a bit, but they inspire so easily and have insane pressure thanks to the Patrician's death beat. Not only that, but they have amazing faction cards that boost their aggro and positional power. Drepper Inspired is the most accurate fighter in the game, and they only need a few plus one damage upgrades to become a menace. Also, Paul of Fear, along with other stacking defensive upgrades, can make Drepper a pain to remove with his base 2 dodge as he dances around the board while attacking and not charging thanks to Death Beat. They're probably borderline S tier, but we'll have to wait and see for that. Headcracker's Mad Mob, another new entrant, may be a surprise to some, especially with their seemingly limited damage potential while uninspired, but they make such a great use of the primacy mechanic which allows them to do crazy things. They inspire fast and can easily get the primacy token thanks to being able to get it off any kill when compared to other warbands who can't get it from wounded fighters. Not only that, but they have lots of uses for the primacy token, discarding it for more mobility or more attacks. Stuff like Primal Lunge makes their attacking output insanely good, 
and Wallop basically does free damage against four wound fighters without any upgrades, so hunting four wound fighters is fairly easy. They have poor defense and can be overrun, but canny players are able to pump out an astonishing number of attacks that hit accurately and hard. Kanan's Reapers are incredibly new, but I still feel confident in putting them into the A tier. They're accurate, defend well, and despite being a six fighter horde swarm warband, they pump out some ridiculous damage. Naderite makes the Mortec fighters combat monsters, bolstered by Mortec Advance to help support the ability, as well as increased mobility and activation efficiency. Cards like Great Strength and Punching Up make the Mortec fighters just as much a threat as Kanan himself, who is a monster in his own right. The fact he is a wizard too gives the warband even more potential to branch into, such as with Lost Pages. Faction cards also operate around making your opponent making terrible choices for themselves, while also being powerful in general. For the B tier, Spike Claw's Swarm is the gem of Shadespire, unmoving but still amazing. Just an innately strong warband, they are very reliant of universal cards for their power, but even then the warband packs incredible mobility, defense, inspiration and mechanics. Scritch is the greatest, yes yes, and flexible. He can either resurrect at the back, or go about claiming enemy heads. Builds currently either focus on hold objectives or aggro. Thanks to cards like punching up and more good attack action upgrades, their relentless aggro build has gotten even better. Magor's Fiends are another non-mover, and are the old staple aggro warband. What they lose in damage, they make up for in dice. Once again, Primacy is the main reason they're up so high, as well as the extra damage now from Universal cards. The extra speed helps for their uninspired movement free. The new Primacy tools haven't boosted their power, but have allowed Magor's Fiends to remain in the B tier. The Thorns of the Briar Queen are another static placement. The warband that has been S tier so many times remains in B tier, although only just. You could argue they're A tier material now. Thorns of the Briar Queen are still very strong. The ability to ignore lethal hexes and Varclav's push are some of their main strengths. Having free faction cards hit, however, is still a big loss. This is why they are in B tier in general. I can easily see them competing and beating A slash S tier warbands, but that would be down to a player's skill alone. For everyone else, I think they will struggle to pilot the Thorns of the Briar Queen successfully with all those faction restricted cards. Thundrix Profiteers, Pew Pew of Death Warband. Thundrix Profiteers are our solid B tier. They still feel the sting of rotation, but the essential card pack has given them some power back to their hold objective build. Primacy still isn't a great boon to them as well. They hold their own thanks to their great fighter characteristics and strong inspire mechanic. They're still as dependable as ever, but suffer due to the popularity and consistency of fast aggro. The monsters of Beastgrave the Grimwatch remain firmly in B tier still. They bleed primacy, but their aggro builds is what keeps them strong. Their free faction card restrictions keep them in needed check, but they cannot be underestimated. The Grimwatch aren't bad, but they aren't the dreaded monsters that they used to be either. The Wormspat are the old shining star of Beastgrave, even if most people wrote them off on launch. They have some strong abilities suited to controlling aggro, but rely on universal cards for their main power. They still feel the sting of not having many universal damage cards. The Wormspat are just a much better Shade Spire warband basically in terms of comparisons, but haven't been able to get much out of Diachasm's universal cards so far. The Crimson Court make their new appearance in B tier. Now while this is probably a shock to a lot of their fans, the warband still suffers due to reliance on hunger counters and general rules bloat. They have solid stats and good fighter cards, but are let down by having mostly range 1 attacks. Their hunger control build is probably A tier, but the Crimson Court currently struggle to deal with the higher placing warbands. Their aggro build is showing more promise, but still pales in comparison to what the better aggro warbands can do in terms of damage and scoring. For C tier, Stormsire's Curse Breakers. This S tier warband sits firmly in the C tier still. Magic has received some more support with Diachasm Universal cards, but that just cements their C tier status. 
their aggro build remains consistent as well as their alright lost page build. Zarbag's gits nevertheless suffer heavily from primacy. The Wolban just bleeds too much glory now, and with primacy about, that's just too much of an advantage to give to your opponent. They're solid, C tier, but massively struggle against any of the high tier aggro Wolbans. Snurk can only do so much. The essential card pack makes them much better at hold objectives, but an unrestricted mischievous spirits and rampant aggro power ensures they have a difficult time competing competitively. What keeps your Thari's Guardians relevant? They can reliably score feed the Beastgrave. As with Horfkorn's Mantrappers, the new Diakasm Universal cards have made that build more consistent. However, they're still quite fragile too, so aren't a fan of Primacy and can only do feed the Beastgrave reliably. As with Stormsize Cursebreakers, they can do an alright lost page build, but it's nothing to write home about, which is why they remain in C tier. It's just Primacy. Grashrax to spoilers are still good, and Draconar is great, but the overall low wound characteristics and primacy just don't help at all. They play the hunter and quarry mechanic well, but Grimwatch do it better. They may have the best butts in Warhammer Underworlds, but the undead ghouls just surpass their aggro power, as well as with the Starblood Stalkers and Kanan's Reapers. Grashrax to spoilers have basically been power crept out of usefulness, but remain steadily in C tier. For Kagra's Ravagers, I wasn't lying last time when I said I was being kind to them. They're barely hanging in C tier. Sure, they can do aggro well, but that's all they can do. Desecration counters are too easy to lose, and the worst thing is that they cannot hold objectives they have desecrated, removing the hold objective playstyle from them. Other warbands do aggro better, and it's a real shame. If they could just hold objectives they have desecrated, then Kagra's Ravagers would immediately gain more flexibility plus depth. The Storm of Celestis blasts their way into C tier. Hold objectives are not in a great state, and thus this warband reflects it. The essential card pack support does help again, but it just cements them in C tier. They're still a great warband, but just don't do too well in the current meta with how overwhelming aggro can be at times. Then there's also Mischievous Spirits. Elethane's Soul Raid sink their way into C tier. While still really new, I did contemplate not adding them yet, but I feel this is a good starting point for them now. The Warband suffers from poor damage output on mostly range 1 fighters with free wounds. Coupled with an overload of rules, Elethane's Soul Raid struggles to do anything well. Sure, they abuse poison cards with the Spine Fin currently, but pray for them once Beastgrave Universal cards rotate out. Hard to see them doing well now and I only expect them to drop further in future editions of the tier list. For D tier, Garrick's Reavers are still in D tier. They are currently a less consistent Grashrax to spoilers. They actually get around Primacy pretty well with all their self damage cards, but their age is showing. Saik is too easy to snipe first, and once he's gone first, the rest of the warband falls apart. They do like the return of pure carnage though. What keeps Steelheart's champions in D tier are two things. They can do an alright control build, and actually do aggro well when they win boards. However, in all other scenarios, they suffer heavily. Free fighters with movement free and range 1 is just such a big handicap. They just struggle getting in and not getting one shot by the opponent. The Sepulchral Guard are basically invalidated by the existence of Thorns of the Briar Queen. Still, the pain of primacy cuts deep coupled with their slow inspire mechanic and general movement characteristic of 2. Eternal Chase helps a lot, but it doesn't counter the main problems that this warband experiences. Hence, D tier. The Fast Riders drop a tier into the D zone due to the Storm of Celestis. While having good range 1 output, it just pales in comparison to the Storm of Celestis. The Fast Riders just take too long to get going and are set back by weak faction cards. The Eyes of the Nine have gone up a tier. Are they still bad? Yes. But the Essential Card Pack has given them a much needed boost to their hold objective playstyle. The Eyes of the Nine still suffer heavily in the current Diachasm meta, but are no longer E tier material. Primacy. The God Swan Hunt give it away now, too easily while struggling to get going thanks to their less than stellar faction objectives. Other warbands do their job, but just better. If they had some more reliable faction objectives, then it really would be a different story. By the time they get going now, the game is generally over. Iron Souls Condemners are Steelheart's champions plus. 
Same faults apply here. They are just slightly more mobile with better faction cards, but then fall down the trap of being a one-trick warband. They have the best inspire mechanic, but it's their movement that holds them back and keeps them in detail. Scaife's Wild Hunt really use the hunter mechanic well, but their low durability and low overall damage are just too big a drawback. They bleed primacy, then struggle to score it themselves. Generally, your main range 1 fighters need 2 plus 1 damage upgrades to be lethal. It's just too much work when Ripper's Snarlfangs exist. They're great for learning the game with, but not so in regards to winning tournaments. Morgwaif's Blade Coven had big problems in Beastgrave, problems which have only gotten worse with Diachasm. Primacy is their bane and they struggle to score it. You'd have a better bet with other aggro warbands. Morgwaif is great, but if she gets killed early, it's game over. If Camus, Lathir, and Carissa were all three wounds instead of two, things might be different. Their combo build is actually a threat and hilariously fun to use, but is nowhere near consistent enough to be a solid threat. Now for E tier, Iron Skulls boys, you know the truth, and so do I. Outside of Gerzag, Iron Skulls boys are just so bad. Bad faction cards, bad damage, bad mobility. They'd need a rewrite to get any higher. It hurts to say, but that's just the truth. Also, just play Morgox Crushers instead. Movement 2. Movement 2 is what holds the Chosen Axes back. Their faction cards are pretty good, but damn that movement too. Their inspire mechanic is not great, but that low movement is just too limiting. It's too easy to pick apart and smash apart the warband in the early game. Eternal Chase is essential for them, but only a partial stopgap to help them cover some of the many holes that fill the Chosen Axes. For the tier list overview, so this is my personal tier list for quarter two of 2021 for Warhammer Underworld's Diachasm. Primacy retains its hold on the Diachasm season. With the addition of universal cards that give you varying effects for discarding the Primacy token, the mechanic has only gotten even better. It's actually a shock to see a player not using Primacy, as basically the whole player base is using it now, and rightly so. Primacy is just so easy to slot in, and the buff it gives to aggro makes it a no-brainer to use. The lack of a new FAQ and Forsaken and Restricted list is really being felt. I don't feel that the meta is healthy at all, and it's only going to get worse as Diachasm goes on. It looks like Games Workshop will wait till a potential Season 5 before we get a balance update. This was a terrible move with Beastgrave, and it's only even worse now. You can see how bad balances with players just choosing not to play with Molog competitively. I'd go so far to say that the only way to play Warhammer Underworlds competitively now is Vanguard format. Only having Diachasm Warbands and Universal cards resembles some semblance of balance, as Diachasm Warbands are much closer together in terms of power with each other, along with better balanced Universal cards. Plus, there's no work that needs to be done with comping non Diachasm Warbands and making new custom far lists. Note this is specifically not any modifications to the Vanguard system, just pure Vanguard. The only thing you might need to do is ban Ferocious Resistance, but even then, just doing pure Vanguard format is personally the best way to play the game now until Games Workshop decides to balance Warhammer Underworlds. That's it for my Warhammer Underworlds tier list quarter 2, 2021. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. As stated earlier, remember this is just my personal outlook on the game if you were to solely play competitively and wanted to win or place in a top cut for a tournament. For the most part, all the warbands are fine to play casually, and even warbands in lower tiers can still win tournaments, it just takes a lot of skill and experience from the user, as well as some added luck, such as with crits. Don't be disheartened if your favourite warband is lower than you expected. Some are just really showing their age. Shadespire and Night Vault warbands would love to see some buffs, but that kind of work isn't likely to be seen, unfortunately. They are approaching three to four years in age, though, and it is still impressive that some of the Shadespire and Night Vault warbands 
are still doing well today. Depending on how things go, the next instalment of the tier list will, for quarter three will drop around, well, early in the middle of quarter three 2021, which should be around August time or September, depending on. Diachasm has changed rapidly in a short period of time thanks to the compressed release schedule, making monthly versions of this tier list, frankly, incredibly difficult to reliably make. By the time of the Q3 update, we would have had the whole Diachasm season to play and experience with. It will be interesting to see how the full seasons of cards and warbands will shape the last few months of Diachasm. So until the next tier list, remember, do not do tier 15. And also, rank your own crits via tier lists yourself. Did you know magical crits are higher than attacking crits?